Hello and welcome. I'm Ashwin Ahmed on this edition of Books Corner. And I'm very pleased to be in conversation with Professor Sriram Chaulia. And today we are going to be discussing his book, Trump, Emerging Powers in a Post-American World. Well, Professor Chalia, welcome, first of all, to the show. It's a pleasure to have you here. Now I want to start with the basic contention you've made. We all know that President Trump is a transactional president. He's made no secret of that. Now, what, but don't you think this was in the coming? I mean, if we look at uh, recent events in the United States, the 2008 uh, uh, global recession, if we talk about, you know, uh, as you said, globalization was left behind and left many Americans behind. So don't you think it was a matter of time that, you know, a president like President Trump would come along or even if another U.S. president would come along, it would be the same thing? Yeah, you know, it is a trend. It's a, he's a product of a trend and of certain social and economic journey in American society, which in turn is related to, as you said, to the global uh, currents. So um, whether we would have had a president like Trump per se um, is, of course, debatable. But yes, some of the traits, isolationism, transactionalism, uh, withdrawal, um, inward looking approach to the world, um, and also a high level of xenophobia and suspicion uh, about uh, other countries and uh, people from other parts of the world, and a kind of, um, you know, parochialism where you know the, the the entire universe is right there in the continental united states and the rest of the world is conspiring against it you know so that kind of also a siege mentality all these come together in the form of trump so yes uh, if you take a longer historical view i think he is the product of uh, deeper structural changes and the rejection of uh, globalization by many parts of the us middle and working classes and uh, their desperation. So the populism of Trump is nothing but a manifestation of these uh, deeper undercurrents. Doctor, I also wanted to contend. Before Trump, we had this contention by thinkers, especially US thinkers, that number one, the US had a right to rule in the sense it had a right to govern the world. It also talked about this liberal, it was the vanguard of this liberal authoritarian order. I mean, it was benevolent liberalism, as you point out. But it, the US had a right to rule and govern the world. It was there during the Obama years. Do you think Trump has totally finished that? Or do you think this is perhaps a blip in history and we'll go back to status quo if he does not retain office? Yeah, you know, that is the fundamental question because this is an election year. And uh, whether Trump wins or whether Joe Biden wins, uh, what will happen to these currents we just spoke about? Or are they going to continue? My sense is that they will because the uh, you know the American um, average American is tired of globalism or being involved in the world. You know, a lot of them believe that there is no major pressing threat like fascism or communism or um, even Al Qaeda or ISIS. I mean, they think these are all past demons. So there's no such, uh, you know, overwhelming uh, perception of threat for which the U.S. needs to be there every corner of the world and um, be the arbiter of the balance of power and of uh, uh, security and stability in every region. That used to be the thinking since Pearl Harbor, since 1941, that, you know, if we don't go and fix our uh, quote-unquote uh, stabilize the world or, 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 or control it, the world will come and haunt us and will, will, you know, will hurt us. But now I think the threat perception is not there. So Trump, in a way, you know, focuses a lot of purely on economic growth. You know, he's struggling right now because suddenly the growth numbers have vanished into thin air due to coronavirus and the, and the pandemic and the, and the disaster, the way he has disastrously handled it. But otherwise, the last three years, you know, he was riding high on this you know, growth phenomenon, you know, domestically, largely domestically generated, uh, and uh, the stock markets are booming. So I think there is that sense that it's a normal time, quote unquote, in a way where um, the U.S. can withdraw and retreat from many of its earlier engagements around the world and just focus on domestic, you know, uh, rebuilding 
after the uh, multiple crises of the last two decades and simply uh, you know get rid of a lot of the responsibilities that they used to assume naturally in the past under the liberal order so now i think even if let us say let us say joe biden wins the election in november this year let's say trump loses um, even then i don't think that he the joe biden used to be a liberal internationalist himself he was vice president to barack obama uh, and okay. he espouses many of the core liberal values you know free trade and human rights and promotion of democracy worldwide and you know intervention in different regions of the world to to maintain uh, pax americana all those things are there in his mind and his makeup you know he's 77 now so you cannot change an old man but i think the forces that are uh, going to push politicians whether it is trump or whoever is in a different direction which i mentioned earlier because end of the day in a democratic country the leaders have to take the cues from the general public and the general public as i said is quite disillusioned with uh, the the notion that the us should go and fix other other people's problems to an extent obama had already moved in the direction and now the disillusionment is almost complete so i don't see the liberal international order coming back i mean trump has dismantled it both uh, through diplomacy and through military retreat from different regions of the world and through lack of any kind of uh, coalition and multilateral alliance building and all those things so um the fundamentals are quite shaky so i don't see it coming back it's not dependent on one personality and uh, like we yeah. do in social science you know the, uh, the 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 president even if uh, sounds like a very you know an executive authoritarian uh, system like the us where there is a lot of power in the president is not the individual that matters you know something else which is deeper and which has to do with the failure of globalization is going to continue to drive i mean the polarization you see in america total division into two halves you know they are just not able to get their head together to be the old superpower i would like to bring you in here on another point which i think is significant and uh, you have looked at emerging powers that that's what you've called them and i was very interested in the prescription you talked about for india where you talked about this being india's moment now uh, i want to contend why do you say that given the multiple challenges we face i mean you we already see you know china across the lac we have us uh, problems in the indian ocean region so why do you say this is india's moment yeah there ashwin what i'm talking about is in the context of american retreat and disinterest and apathy about every region of the world the onus is on the powerful countries in different regions to be able to run you know and stabilize and maintain order in their respective backyards right so uh, india has always wanted to uh, be the main power in south asia uh, a kind of a benevolent hegemon if you like to call it uh and we have always been quite protective of our sphere of influence in this region south and cent- to some extent even central asia so uh and we have now over time expanded um our definition of our backyard we 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 like to think that we are an indian ocean power we are an indo pacific power and so on right so we've always had that ambition and to some extent we used to rely on the us presence in the region to be able to solve our strategic dilemmas in the past i mean before trump so you had you know us um, navy and the us specific command um, and its presence across the maritime domain that we used to feel was good for us because it was able to counterbalance the chinese expansion which would be threatening our backyard um, and secondly even um, in the in the in the territorial domain there was afghanistan there was a nato presence there and as long as the us military and the nato were there we would always say no 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 we will not need to any boots on the ground we don't have to do a lot we just do development work there we just do capacity building there the fighting and the you know the actual warfare um, and the support for that will be done by nato forces now trump is you know so desperate to pull out as we know he's already done a deal with the taliban and he's pulling out and uh, likewise with the maritime trump uh, has not shown any cap- capability as i said to build a broad ranging coalition of like minded countries who are all worried about china's rise so that's why the chinese call trump jiangguo jiangguo is a kind of like a, someone who enables the chinese to be powerful you know so in yeah. other words yeah. even though china has done what uh, yeah. sorry to interrupt you but i wanted to ask you here there is a very interesting quote you you quoted some prominent uh, chinese personalities 
who said that you know secretly we believe trump is good for china now why have you come to that conclusion or why have they yeah so that's the point you see because um, trump has done a very uh, hard nosed uh, trade war with china we know that and he has been you know pressurizing them to buy more american uh, made products and they have done a deal in 2019 a little a few months after this book came out uh, they did this deal and um, the chinese promised to buy 200 billion dollars worth more of us products to even out the trade imbalance but what trump has not done is to create this what obama at least uh, at least on paper had a so called rebalancing or pivot to asia strategy which was to try and you know amalgamate all the regional actors who are scared of chinese expansion and uh, create military interoperability with them and put them all together so like some kind of a phalanx uh, in the naval domain and that will check the expansion of the pla navy uh, that has not happened um and trump you know he deals one on one because he thinks that every country is a competitor or or an enemy nobody is an ally he doesn't believe that democracies are better and are close. should we should promote democracies over authoritarian countries like china so all those liberal maxims are gone now so we are on our own so a country like india um to some extent of course we still have we are under trump administration if not trump himself i show that in the book we have worked with members of the trump administration who are more in the old liberal internationalist mold and uh, we have done the uh, logistics the uh, agreement and all these things uh, with the sh for sharing of bases and such things yes, so with the us we have some things going but it's not a big coalition I out there let me here and ask you something you you say yes and uh, i agree this is a time for india and other the other emerging powers like turkey nigeria etc that you mention but at the same time you know we will have to contend with china so my question to you is won't these emerging powers india and the others have to deal i mean brazil as you correctly mentioned is already very economically dependent on china so are we to an extent so do you see number one a uh, china a rise of china as a global hegemon and what will it look like and what will it mean for us well uh, you know before corona virus happened uh one would think that trump has really um you know uh, handed it on a platter to the chinese basically to dominate and to expand but now uh, i would say and this is after my book came out uh i think the chinese image has suffered tremendously and the suspicion of china and of dependence on china has grown around the world so uh, i would not place my bets on china replacing the us as the as the global hegemon i mean that was that's always what the western liberals say the critics of trump have been saying uh, in the us and in europe that you know if you withdraw if the us sits back the chinese will run amok and will take over the world but my contention is that that's actually underestimating the emerging powers because that means that essentially there are only two big players uh, it's a g2 type of world the us is stepping back the chinese are you know f filling the vacuum but my point is that the vacuum can be filled by others and we are not going to we are not the the emerging powers the ones i've covered in the book the ones you mentioned turkey nigeria brazil india you can add a few others uh, these are just examples to make the larger point emerging powers are not willing to hand over um, you know hegemony uh, or just uh, give up their spheres of influence to the chinese so if the us is not with us or if the us is disinterested if the us is you know embroiled in its own internal turmoil like we are seeing uh, then uh, relying on the us is not necessarily the main strategy for us we will need to find other means so that this book is about that you know i'm asking each of these uh, emerging powers that look we do have internal problems like you said each of the countries i show have massive domestic problems we are big countries huge populations lots of developmental issues at the same time if we um do not find innovative and new means to counterbalance the expanding chinese power then that western liberal um scenario will come true that the us is no, is, is maybe just a great power not a superpower anymore withdrawn in the to the western hemisphere just to its uh, neighboring countries uh, in in central and south america and then you have the whole of asia and the middle east and uh, latin america where the chinese seem to be dominant so uh, i think i don't think we want to allow that you know and this book is a call not to allow her um, 
Professor, I want to ask you here. It's right that you know we could uh, India could be a plutocracy. We could uh, reach out to other nations, but uh, you know there's a big gap. I mean, ASEAN. We haven't finalized RCEP. You know, Quad. Of course, it's because of President Trump. But you know, yes, we've uh, pr pr Prime Minister Modi took the lead in uh, during SARC during the pandemic, etc. So my question is. Uh, don't you think that India still has a long way to go, pandemic or no pandemic, to kind of be the leader of a voice of plutocracies? And uh, maybe that work won't happen overnight. And my second question is, as you talked about other emerging powers, won't other emerging powers also, like Turkey, etc., Brazil, also see it in their interest to further their own interests? Why would they, you know, allow India space? Yeah, so the, the 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 picture is going to be see a multipolar world as we've always wanted in India uh, implies that uh, there is a um, zone beyond which none of the regional powers can exert influence on other regions. So what we're talking about is that the order is going to be now confined. So there is going to be no more global hegemons like what was the U.S. at its heyday after the uh, demise of the Soviet Union. You know that unipolar era where there was a single global hegemon is over now. So what we are looking at is we will need to address our own respective hotspots. Now with India, I already mentioned Afghanistan. I mentioned the Indo-Pacific. Indo with Nigeria, it's the whole of West Africa and the Sahel region where France has been uh, you know, a big uh, uh, threat to Nigerian influence. Uh, we, if you think of Brazil, it's the, it's the entire South American region where they used to exert leadership but are losing it now. Uh, with Turkey, they wanted to dominate the whole Arab world and bring back the Ottoman uh, power. And now they are really struggling. So, re so reliance on the U.S. is not going to help on any of these countries as a fundamental uh, way out of their dilemmas. Yes, tactically, we need the U.S. The U.S. still, we, we call it strategic, uh, comprehensive uh, global strategic partnership and all these words uh, for, for the U.S. relationship. It will remain. But what I'm saying is that alone is not sufficient for us to ward off the Chinese anymore now. So we will need to find other forms of small group coalitions. We will need to find regional groupings. We need to establish each of our countries, the emerging powers, um, greater legitimacy among our extended neighbors. Uh, Turkey and Brazil, I find in this book, have lost it due to misguided leadership of uh, uh, President Tayyip Erdogan and uh, President uh, Jair Bolsonaro. But Nigeria and India, I'm still hopeful that they can do it. And end of the day, you know, the Chinese also should not be overestimated, right? I mean, they are now undergoing, as, as we know, a severe economic downturn of their own since the coronavirus started. So to, uh, to, so I think we need to be realistic as to where to block and where to allow, you know, these uh, extra regional powers to come into our backyards. And I think we need a rethink, basically, about our fundamental alignments, alliances, coalitions, and of course, other forms like we are not spending enough on defense and military, as you very well know, is less than two yeah. percent of GDP. How can we match the Chinese? The Chinese, despite coronavirus, have raised their GDP spending from six percent to eight percent uh, this year. So yeah. uh, they are intent on trying to push further, despite their own internal problems. So if we give up now, if we say, well, we'll wait for America to come back, maybe someday, maybe under Joe Biden or some other future post-Trump leadership, the U.S. will again come back and play this big counterbalancing role. I think we're going to miss the window of opportunity. It'll be too late and the Chinese would have taken over. So I think it's important for us. This is the window of opportunity where we have to be proactive. Each country I've suggested must have its own coalition and its own strategy and readers can see that. But this is just I'm, I'm simply trying to show a future vision for a multipolar order and how it can be achieved. You know, we have to assume that we will we should be leaders we we are not followers of the us right and we don't want chinese hegemony so we no, have a tradition yeah. of ambition and independence but how to yeah. uh, uh, take it forward to reality is the real diplomatic and strategic question that is a, a wonderful note to end on india has a window of opportunity despite impediments under prime minister modi it definitely can seize the moment in a growing multipolar world Professor Cholia, thank you so much for talking to us. I'm Ashwin Ahmed. Thank you for watching and do tune in next time. Goodbye.